<laughs> I'm hosting this session titled Comics in the Digital Age. Now, please, please put your hands together and help me welcome our panelists. First, we have, yeah, go ahead and clap, go ahead and clap. First of all, uh, those of you who are full sailors will recognize this man, Roland Mann, who teaches uh, the comic book class here. To his right is Jeff Whiting, who is an artist who's worked on various titles such as The Tick, uh, various titles for Marvel's Malibu Comics Ultraverse, and he's working on a few projects now with Roland. And last but certainly not least, we have Barry Gregory, who is the co-founder of Kablam Digital Printing and has worked in quite a few different uh, things in comics. Too many for me to list in the time we have here. <laughs> so our topic today is comics in the digital, a digital age, and I'm going to throw out the first question to y'all. How has the rise of digital comics affected the industry? So whoever wants to go first. I'll take the easy answer first. Um, uh, digital, the, uh, comics in the digital age, the one thing that, uh, the, the, the most, I don't know, the biggest thing is that comics are easily accessible to everyone today. Where once before we had to go to comic shops or the spinner racks at the 7-Elevens, for those of you old enough to remember that, um, anyone with a digital, with a computer or any kind of digital, I, I imagine most of you in here have phones and uh, tablets, you can get the, all your comics, or most of your comics, you can get them that way. That's the, that's the biggest change that uh, digital comics have brought on. So I'll give the easy answer and leave the hard ones to you guys. <laughs> Jeff? Well, I, I think it has opened it up more to, uh, to make it easier for people to buy. Um, I, I, most of the comics I buy now are digital, and uh, I, I get them on my phone. I don't have to go to the, to the store and see that something that was supposed to be in my pull box is not, and everything is there, and I have it all accessible you know, at, at a moment's notice on any of my devices, which is, I like. So it's, for me, it's, it's really opened up a lot of opportunities, and I imagine for people who don't have good stores in their areas, uh, it makes it easier for them to go and, and not miss an issue and, and be able to buy back issues easily, too. So. Good. Well, it's, it's, allowed for, it's allowed for growth for the first time in, in decades. For, for decades, the comic industry had been contracting. And with the rise of digital, it started to expand for the first time in, in, in a very long time. And the reason that it had been contracting is because the comics industry had been pretty much confined to comic shops, which are great, but they tend to be insular. There's, there's a tendency towards a, a, a tree fort mentality. It's, you know, it's a boys club, and you're not allowed you know, unless you're part of the clique. That's, that's changing, but that's, that's kind of been the entrenched way that comic shops operated for a very long time. And with digital, it allowed us to expand away from that and give people who weren't part of the clique, weren't part of the tree fort, a chance to have access to the same and, and even you know, more in different comics as it's grown. All right, very good. So this kind of brings us to a question, uh, our second question which really kind of goes to the heart of what, it, what digital comics are. So you have, on the one hand, base, just scans of paper comics that you can go through as PDFs, but you also have others uh, out there, such as Mark Wade, who is really pioneering a new type of comic. It's almost reminiscent of the motion comics that I remember from when I was a kid, you know, the old Captain America and Spider-Man stuff, where it's more just kind of barely moving images. And so the question is, should digital comics be just scans of paper comics, or should the industry embrace the technology and embrace, I'm sorry, and change the format around? Well, go, it, okay. it, go it's, it's, in, it's in my self-interest to say this, but I think there's a, there's a third type of digital comic, too, and that's the digitally printed comic. Yes. Um, of which it's... Basically, it's from the same set of files that your, you know, your digital download is, but it allows you to, to print copies in very, very low uh, runs. So if you still want your comic in print, and there's a huge section of the comics community that still very much wants print comics, uh, you know, some of us want print and digital. You know, we want the digital for the convenience that we can read on our tablets, 
but you know we still want that that physical copy that we can you know pull out and look at and bag and board and, and so you know, digital printing allows you to have the best of both worlds really it's 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 both digital and print so it's kind of a, a something of a hybrid there um, on the what what Mark Wade's doing with Thrillbent I'm I'm really happy to see somebody with a, a profile as high as his really embrace digital I'm not so crazy about the little, you know, yeah. bubbles loading in one at a time, and you got to click this to go to the next panel. I, I, I'm kind of a comics purist. I'd really, you know, I'd like to, if I'm, I like reading comics digitally. I like it a lot. But I want to take my tablet, and I want to look at the whole page the way the artist intended me to see it. I want to get that closure from panel to panel. I want to, you know, read the page the way he wants me to read it, and then I want to slide and go to the next page. I, you know, I don't, I'm not crazy about that. You know, this figure loads in, and then this balloon loads in. I don't know. I think I think Mark will grow, outgrow that after a little while. You know, we all kind of experimented with that when we first started doing digital, and we all pretty much abandoned it after a while. And part of the problem with the uh, motion comics is that, um, and I'm, I'm kind of quoting my, my uh, the friend at DC, is that part of the problem is you look at a motion comic, and they come off looking cheap. They come off looking like uh, cheap animation. So even though we can, we're going to call it motion comics, when you look at it, it's just, you know, it just looks like cheap animation. And so the problem you end up with is like, why do I want to look at this cheap animation when I can watch something that's, you know, that's actually really, really good? And so, I mean, w you know, even in my class, I mean, we, we show some uh, motion comics, but that's generally sort of the, the, the reaction is that it looks cheap. You know, that may be interesting, and but it just it looks like cheap animation. So, well, as as an artist, it's interesting to get to work beyond just uh, you have 24 pages to fill, and if you could break that into well, now you just have an unlimited number of of panels, and you can draw a whole bunch of neat. You know, you have a different screen aspect and a different content area to work with. But if if it is also going to be printed, then you're you are you do pretty much have to stay to that uh, standard page size and, and page count. Um, so I, I, I like the, some of the ones where it, it, they've got it formatted so that the, uh, the panels kind of appear in twos and threes to, to fill the screen nicely and, and goes on to the next one. But I, like Barry was saying, I do like how the, when an artist lays out a page and it's, that's the flow they want you to, your eye to follow, that's, you should try to adhere to that too. So, and part of the problem with scanning original or, or scanning a, a print book is that when you try to uh, convert it digitally to these to to the you know the rectangular devices, I don't know what you want to call them. Um, you do run into some of those problems. Is that you end up seeing a splash page, which is meant for the entire page. You end up seeing a splash page in a very small format, um, or if an artist. In particularly, I know we did have a lot of this in the 1990s where uh, a lot of artists give you all these weird, you know, triangular, uh, very weird shaped panels. How does that translate into a, a rectangular, um, you know, digital device? Is that there's, there's some interpretation problems going from the original printed copy to that where if you design your comic with this in mind, then you either design all your, you know, all your panels upright or or a long ways, and it's a little bit easier. And there's something to be said, I think, just for, for page structure in, in general. I, you know, I think there's, there's a reason why comics, you know, since the 19, you know, 40s have been drawn basically at a, you know, at a two parts to three parts ratio, and in increments, you know, around 20 to 30 pages. There, there's something elegant about that format. It, it works. And so when you start chopping it up, Sometimes you run the risk of getting something that's less than the sum of its parts, and I think mm -hmm. that's what happens a lot with, with the yeah. They become books. more like a comic strip yeah. than a, a comic book because, as you were talking about the full page, and we even talk about this in my class, is that you know the pages are designed a certain way to make the reader move through the page, and it presents the panels, you know, in some kind of sequence that makes your eye move that way and carries the reader that way. Well, when you've only when you're presenting one panel at a time, it changes that whole thing. Well, this brings, up, uh, brings us to a good segue into the next question, because we're talking about art right now. <coughs> and 
one area that we need to really kind of dive into is, well, how do you make money at this? How do you make money as an artist? Because our goal here at Full Sail is to prepare you all to be professionals, and being professional means partially uh, that you get paid. And so in the past, artists have supplemented their income by, send, uh, by selling prints at conventions. But do, uh, does the digital comics format affect that in any way? And Jeff, you may be best uh, equipped to answer that. A lot of my art now is done uh, purely in, in Photoshop or uh, I, I do all my inking in Manga Studio, so most of my art is in the computer. Um, it's easy to generate prints. Um, where I run into problems is like selling original pages. I don't have any original art anymore on paper. It's all all digital. Um, and it's I, I remember when I was doing a lot of stuff for Malibu, and I, I would get FedEx boxes in the, and you know come every day or every couple of days and ink a, a seven or eight pages and then send them out. And now they just all come in a in a Dropbox, and you download them, ink them and upload them again so there's, uh, there's the workflow is much quicker and uh, a lot a lot cheaper I, I think than uh, what they were doing before with all the postage but the um, prints I, th I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities to it, since the work already is digital a lot of it like I don't have to scan it in because I've already got the files so it's it's easy to make uh, to make prints and, and then to do digital printing it's um, Are your prints in higher quality if you do everything digitally as well? Uh, good quality is the print, yeah. yeah. You should work in like 600 DPI, so it's all real high res. It works out. Well, I think digital actually can, in, can enhance your convention uh, sales. If, if, you've got a, if you've got a strong presence in the, in the digital world, especially if you're you know, you're maximizing your social media uh, outlets, uh, and 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 building something of a of a of a name and reputation for yourself, then when you do go to shows, you're more likely to have people who are, if not familiar with your work, they've at least seen your name. Uh, you know, they may have clicked on a link or two of yours from time to time, and you've got something there to to sell them. You know, the biggest problem that that we really had when you know when when Roland and I first started going to conventions a long time ago was anonymity. Nobody knew who we were. Uh, that doesn't have to be a problem anymore, you know, thanks to being able to you put your work up on DeviantArt, on the social media sites. You can really build an online presence as a digital artist. And then when you set up at that convention, you've got some, some physical you know, stuff there to sell to the people who have a better chance of being familiar with you or your work now. And, you know, creative writers hear this all the time anyway, so it does not even just comic book writers, but part of, part of the job of a writer is, and, it's, and I get it, it's frustrating. No, most writers want to, uh, you know, disappear into a cave, write their stories, and then just let the world go by them. I get that, but that's not the way it works, and, and it doesn't work that way in comics either. So, so part of the job of the writer is once you get it written and get your material out there, you have to go market it. You have to go make people aware uh, of it, which means you know you got to to post to your Facebook groups, your Twitter, your you know Vines, all the all, all your you know various social media. You have to make people aware of it. And then the beauty is because we are in the digital age, people can immediately go buy something where you know 20 years ago you could have done this and they would have had to go you know physically go find it. Well, you can tweet them now a link to. Uh, to a, your book over on, on Indie Planet, and they can buy it just like that. So uh, being the marketer, uh, as once your work is there, is, is frustrating for most of the, in the uh, well, for well, most creators. I, most creators just want to create and leave the marketing to someone else. Unfortunately, we don't live in that age anymore. We, we have to market our own stuff. So, Just yesterday, uh, a guy commented on a, on a, on a post of mine I liked his avatar, so I clicked to see who he was. I liked the comics I saw at his site, and I spent 30 bucks, you know, just because he, you know, he made a comment, and I, I thought his, his graphic was interesting, and he made a sale, you know, just like that. 
Very good. I'm glad we're kind of sliding almost naturally in, into collaboration because cl uh, comics are, to various extents, collaborative efforts. You know, there's a lot of different artists. There's a lot of different cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. And one of the interesting aspects, I think, of the kind of rise in digital or just really the rise in uh, communications technology is that now we have more non-native English-speaking artists out there. And so has the internet and other digital resources helped bridge, you know, this language barrier? Because if I'm writing in English, you know, there's certain artists out there who uh, their grasp of English may not be as strong as mine. So does this open up new opportunities for collaboration? I, I, I'll jump on that one. I, you know, I'll say absolutely yes because um, it makes it makes communication uh, faster. And so, um, I mean, back in the days of the FedEx stuff, it, if I worked with somebody, um, and I worked with a Brazilian artist there for a while, uh, I mean, we had to you know it take a week to get pages because he would do his his artwork and FedEx it into us, but it's still coming from overseas. You know, it, it takes a week to get here. Uh, and then there's the, the problem of, well, what's going on in this panel? I don't understand what this is. And then you look at the script and you find out, oh, well, it's a, it, it's a language barrier issue. He didn't understand that, you know, that this golf, that this, when I said a club, they're on a golf course. When I said a club, you know, I, I meant a golf club and not a caveman club. Yeah. Uh, and so there's there there is there's still the language barrier, but you find that uh, with our instant communication, you can you know you can address issues, um, things that they don't understand really really quickly. And a beautiful thing is like like Jeff mentioned uh, Dropbox is that it doesn't matter where in the world they are if they have access to the internet, they can do their artwork, put it in Dropbox, and I can get it literally. 30 seconds after they've uploaded. It depends on how big the file is, but mm -hmm. that quickly. So uh, that's really, really nice. Yeah. yeah I've, I've had great uh, networking opportunities, too. So I, I remember in the early days when Marvel bought Malibu, uh, there were a group of us on, uh, I think it was CompuServe at the time, and we were they had some messages going back and forth, and uh, somebody had heard about the sale, and we were talking about it. And, and when I called into the office, and I, I said, "So, what's going on with the sale?" And they were like, "How do you know about that? That just happened." And it's like, "Well, we're we're talking amongst ourselves out here." And they, they were they were surprised that we were had it, had this information. And, and now it's even just you know something happens anywhere, and it's on Twitter, and yeah. and you know, it, and so many of, of artists now that you know we're all connected on Facebook and we have lots of messages back and forth and uh, collaborations are just so easy now. Well, that little translate button helps a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see something on one, of the, uh, on, on one of your feeds that's in a foreign language, but you like the art, you click that little translate button and, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I've got a, uh, the, the flatter that I'm using right now for some of the, some of the coloring that I'm doing is in the Philippines. And uh, so I get a I get a new page. I just put it in my Dropbox, send him a note. You know, a couple hours later, it's you know it's it's in my Dropbox flatted. It's it seems almost miraculous compared to you know what we were dealing with just you know a decade or so ago. Yeah. And I, I've seen some great artists that I are not English speaking that I'm I've added to to my friends list, and I I can't understand a word of what they say, but I know their their art is fantastic, and it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to to be able to have them share it and be able to to see it and have access art, to it. Art's and a universal language. Isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. Part of, part of the universality of of comics is when you're just looking at a penciled page, you can't tell what language that artist speaks. You know, the only real problem that you run into anymore is, like you said, is with idioms. Yeah. You know, things like that, where you know there might be some ambiguity in exactly what the translation of you know, of that idiom or that you know. Uh, uh, was. Yeah, he really drives his character up the wall. Exactly. Then, what? <laughs> what is that? So, you know, but, but that's, a, that's a good challenge for the writer then is to, you know, is, is to try to write without using, you know, figures of speech to write, you know, more clearly and more concisely. So clearly and concisely and with lots of details. <laughs> yes. So, one of the I guess uh, one of the hallmarks of contemporary comics writing is what's called decompression. 
decompression storytelling. And so how has the digital movement actually affected this? And is that a good thing or a bad thing if it has? I think Barry should go first one on this one. Are, are you sure? <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody else might get a word in. If you like to go. Um, okay. Decompression. Um, decompression is a fantastic technique for slowing down time when you're telling a story or even stopping time when you're telling a story so as to force the reader to focus on a detail that you as the writer or the storyteller believe is really, really important. Whether you want them to focus on an emotion, whether you want them to focus on uh, an item in the scene that's going to play a relevant you know, part later. If you're trying to slow things down to a crawl, if you're trying to stop time, decompression is a fantastic technique. What most people call decompression storytelling is not decompression, it's just bloating. It's just sloppy storytelling. Um, storytelling is compression. That's what a narrative is, is a compression. It's taking the events of a story and crushing them into a, crushing is probably not the right word, <laughs> massaging them into a, into a narrative, okay? That's compression. If you want to decompress a moment to make a point, great. But if your narrative isn't going like this, but going like this, you're just meandering, and you're wasting your reader's time, and you're abusing your artist. Um, I, I, could, I could go on railing <laughs> well, um, what's called decompression, but... Well, have you noticed any change in that? It's like, gotten worse. It's gotten worse? Yeah, yeah. Do you think digital has affected that, yes. or is it... Okay. Well, it's, it's not digital's fault. It's, it's just... Uh, I, I, I think it, it's just one of those really bad trends that's gotten worse and worse. I, I don't think digital's necessarily to blame. Digital's perpetuated it because digital's perpetuating you know, pretty much all the trends that are going on in comics right now. But, you know, it's actually kind of weird, I, I find. I, I find the whole move to decompression uh, in, in modern comics kind of strange because, you know, we're, as a society, we're going to shorter attention spans. Yeah. And so we, we like things. I mean, we talked about the, the Vines and the, the, you know, the Twitters. You're, you're very limited to very short bursts of information. And so I don't understand why uh, in, in a 24-page you know, comic, suddenly, you know, we're only getting... You know, we're, we're getting a short, yeah. a very short, over a long span of, of pages. So for me, it just kind of, it's kind of a contradictory idea. I don't know why it's happening, but... It, 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 works, it works the opposite of the way it's supposed to. Uh, if, if the idea is to slow down or stop time, then when you're doing decompressed storytelling, what they call decompressed storytelling, it has the opposite effect. It speeds you up. You're through with a 22-page book in five minutes. Yep. It's, it's not slowing you down, it's speeding you up. And as a consumer, you feel cheated. You do. You feel like I just spent six bucks on this and it took me five minutes. Uh, I, I bought a, I bought a, a scholastic uh, book for my, for my daughter uh, a few months back uh, by an artist that I really like. I'm not crazy about his storytelling, but I really like his art. And, uh, and it was 200 some odd pages. I, I literally read it in 15 minutes. It was so decompressed that what he did in 200 pages could have been done in 20 pages. Well, it's seen if, if there are like a few moments in a, a story where you can, you can use that, but not the, like you're saying, the whole, the whole thing, but um, that gets back to uh, the format of the page. Like a, if you have a, your standard rectangle, uh, you, can, you can lay out a sequence um, that might be broken up if you're looking at it digitally, like you said, on a, on a tablet or a device where you may not be able to see all the panels at once. And if you're scrolling by and it's essentially the same panel over and over, that's kind of, you know, why, why am, you know, my stuck? Or it, <laughs> it, it could be awkward in a, a different format. Um, well, all of, those, all of those little moment to moment transitions. That, 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 that writers are doing now in comics that, that are bloating the books. All of those little moment-to-moment -moment, moment transitions should be there in a good story, but they should be happening in the gutters. They should be crafting their stories in such a way that 
they make you see those moment-to-moment -moment transitions without actually showing them to you. They need to be making them happen in your head by the way the stories are laid out, by the way the panels are laid out. Comics are not paper films. If you, comics are actually closer to film strips than they are to paper. I mean, you, if, you, if you think about it, in a, in a, in a 22-minute television drama, you've got, what, uh, 24 frames a second, what's what, 30, 31, 32,000 still images that you're seeing in a 24-minute television show. In a comic book, if you've got four panels a page and 24 pages, you've got 96 still images. Okay? But if you, do, if you craft it carefully, then you can make that 96, those 96 still images last about the same amount of time that those 32,000 do on television, and you can get just as much information in. If not more. Or if not more. Yeah. Or you can decompress it and have them read it in three minutes and be <laughs> done with it. <laughs> exactly. Um, almost went off on an anecdote, but no. Um, what are the differences in experience between writers and artists when it comes to digital comics, or is there a difference? And we could even add, well, no, I'm not going to do that. Never mind. I think for a writer, I don't, I don't know that there's... Um, you're talking about from the creation? Yeah, the creation. I think for a writer, I don't know that there's that, that big a difference in the creation process. I mean, you know, we can talk about technology in general. That you know, I went from writing on an you know, electronic typewriter to you know, n this high-tech computer today. Uh, but I don't know that, that the writing process in and of itself... You know, I, I, for me, personally, I still create you know, in longhand on paper and then... Uh, you know, type it in. The difference is is how quickly I can get it to an artist. You know, where before I would have had to you know print it out or make a photocopy and you toss it in an envelope, lick the stamp, and you know hope that the the mailman didn't uh, didn't drop it. So I, for for me, I don't I don't know that a writer's um, creation experience is that much different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as an artist, I know, like I was saying before, we've eliminated the mailing the pages back and forth. Um, they show up, and you know, I don't have to do them in lots of like eight, seven or eight pages anymore. You, you finish a page, you put it in the Dropbox, and it goes on to the next process. And the, the only difference is uh, back in the 80s and 90s when we worked on a book, you know, the penciler would do 24 pages. I, they would all come to me. I would ink them. They would go to a letterer, and then at the end of it, they would be broken up, and the, the penciler would get like two-thirds of them, and I would get a third of the pages, and we would have these nice pages to do original art yeah what we wanted with and and now the penciler still has his 24 pages of uninked pencils and I have digital files of, of inks and <laughs> <laughs> so do you work primarily do you use like a Wacom tablet or anything mm -hmm. like that and don't yeah. use paper anymore program called the manga studio for and even for correct me if I'm wrong but even for those who don't use the the digital inking what they what they'll do a lot of times is uh, the the artist will scan their pencils in, mm -hmm. get them to the uh, to the inker, and if the inker does not digital ink, the inker's responsibility is to print it out and then actually ink over a printout of mm -hmm. the pencils. So they don't ink the original pencils. Uh, is, am I right? Yeah. 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 You would. I've done that before, and I've tried to turn it into like a uh, scan the pencils in, and then in Photoshop turn them blue. So I print out, and it's like a blue line, mm -hmm. and then ink the pages, but then they have to be scanned back in, so it's, and if you're doing it at almost like 11 by 17, you have to have a, a very large scanner and a, a very large printer, and I've, I've actually like done pages in halves, <laughs> and then uh, reassembled them, which is, is not fun, so I prefer just doing it all in the computer now, since that's where it's going to end up at the end anyways. And probably the, the biggest change, very you might address this, is uh, the coloring aspect of yeah. it. As far as what digital has done for us, and you know, Barry did some coloring for me way back before we had the, the all the computer stuff. So, yeah, the 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 the, the first job I ever colored for Marvel, uh, I actually, it, I, I tell the story and people don't believe me, but even though this was this was in the 90s, um, they sent me photocopies of the of the pencils, and I wasn't supposed to actually color these. What I was supposed to do was take a ruler and a pen and draw a line from every segment on the photocopy to the margins where I would write a Pantone color. 
Okay, that was how you colored books in you know just a couple of decades ago. Yeah. Uh, no actual color on the page, just a white photocopy with a lot of ballpoint pen lines and Pantones written in the margins. And I was allowed uh, what they called uh, airbrush effects. I was allowed three per book. Um, so, so if I wanted a gradient anywhere, I had three gradients. Uh, and I had to tell them, okay, here's this, this, in this background, I want a gradient. And I want it to start at this Pantone, and I want it to end at this Pantone. That was one of my three airbrush effects. Well, why was that? Was it had to do something with cost? Did it cost more to do that? No, it, it, was, it was just the way the, the way the process was done. From, from there, they would go to somebody who was, who was literally cutting film mm. and, uh, and you know, cut and stacking the films to make the plates. Yeah, and they, they actually had to use the, 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 the three different or the four different layers of acetate. Uh, those who've been in my class know what uh, Zipatone is, and basically the plates were like Zipatone yeah. with all the colors, and so they would have to lay those one, of, one, one on top of the other in order to get the, uh, the desired color that they wanted, yeah. mm -hmm. and they would have to know, well, I need, you know, 20% Y or, or and 30%, you know, uh, you know, magenta to create this color. I don't know what that is, but, but to create this color, and they would have to know that, and it would have to go into that place, you know, that, that's that, you know, the color slide Barry had called out, and then it would create, then the final, you know, the final view would create the color that they wanted. It, it, was, just a, it was just a matter of the, of, the, of the size of the dot pattern in that area. Yeah. So it's just a, out of my own curiosity, as a follow-up question, do you enjoy the work now more? Like, you know, I'm assuming now you can actually color on the thing and not oh. have to do the ballpoint pens and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, much, much, it's much more fun now. It's much more fun. <laughs> How about you, Jeff? Do you ever miss just working with pencil and paper? Uh, sometimes, but I, I think I've, I've gained more than I, has been taken away. Um, one of the nice things like working in Manga Studio or, or even Photoshop is you can, you can work everything in layers. So I've inked you know, different panels on different layers or different characters or backgrounds in a different layer. And when the colorist gets that, rather than having to, you know, well, if I want to mute the background or something, it, it's already separated for them, so they, they have a, a lot easier time to work with the, uh, because it's already in segments that they can, they can do color holds and different effects too. So it's a friend of mine posted the other day that uh, sometimes he feels guilty, you know, since he's gone all digital about the fact that you know he doesn't have boards to show people anymore. And he said, but then I think about perspective rulers and that all just goes away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I think, I think we have a, a better product now. I, I think the, the, we have a better end product because of what digital allows for us to do. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, one of the colorists that uh, used to work at Malibu when I was an editor there posted something recently on Facebook about Photoshop. And they basically took modern designers and colorists and set them down with Photoshop 1. <laughs> and one of the biggest reactions that, uh, kind of, of course, you know how Facebook is. You, if you see the video, somebody, you've got to watch it. So um, one of the, the biggest reactions to a lot of these designers was that there's only one undo. <laughs> so they, uh, they could only go back one step if they made a mistake. And that's one of the things I think about our modern technology. You know, you can go, you can take something, or you get a wild hair, and you can kind of follow something through. And they say, oh, no, I don't really like that. That doesn't look good. Then you can go to that, you know, step backwards and just step it all out. But, you know, Photoshop 1, you had one undo. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as a, a self-publisher, it's, it's so much easier now to... You can finish a book, and then within the hour, you could upload your files and and have a book available to someone to, to purchase or download, or or even you know start the printing process right away. There's none of that. Uh, you know, well, I have to put it in the catalog, and then I have to wait months for it to to actually come out and and someone to get to enjoy it. And it's it just moves right into the uh, the reader's hands. You know. Or even you know, the, the worst prospect of, I've finished, I've got to submit it now. <laughs> and then you, s you know, start sending it out to all the publishers. I think that's one of the biggest things that digital has allowed for, uh, and we touched on this early on, but I think that's one of the biggest things that, that we can't you know, underestimate is that anybody can do, if you can, if you can produce the pages, anybody can, can, can print and release a comic today. I mean, you can have, if, you know, if anybody in here has got one done, 
all you got to do is, you know, talk to somebody like, like Barry, and, and, you know, you can have your book available on Indie Planet in the time it takes them to process it, of course, but, I mean, it's, you, know, you don't have to go through the whole submission process like you once had to. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I bring up one potentially negative, or not potentially, I think it's definitely a negative Im, uh, impact that digital has had, and, and I've been guilty of this myself, but that's depublishing, where you, you put something out, and then you decide, and, and people have purchased it, it's, it's out there, and then you decide, you know, I could have done that better. And so you take it down and you redo it and you put it back up again. I, I, that's not a phenomenon that, that happened before the digital age, not very often, because it was very expensive and difficult to do. Digital makes that very easy to do now, and I think that's a bad thing. I think, by and large, once it's out there, you know, it, it really needs to either be published or not be published, yeah. you know. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to get a do-over. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've had a lot of art that I've put out that I've looked at later and go, oh, that could have been better. And, and, but I'm, I'm not one to want to go back and redo things. I'd rather... Right. I mean, it, I think you're, it's, it's good to go back and look at it and go, I could have done that better. It's not good to stop doing something new so that you can go back and fix that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. you, you need to keep moving on. Once it's done, you know, right. it's there and move on. That's, and that's a really hard skill to master, no matter what form of art that you do, because I think all artists, in some respects, are perfectionists. And I know for me, when I'm doing my own writing and I'm on the sixth draft I'm of whatever I'm working on, I'm like, okay, I've got to stop now. This is as good as it's ever going to get, and I need to send it out and start working on something else. And hopefully you know, it'll be, it'll, the next one will be better than the last. But it's, it's really difficult. And I think you bring up a good point in that kind of having that magic delete skill is probably going to make us stare a little too much in our own belly button, so to speak. <laughs> um, but, you know, this, this brings up a good question. Uh, one that I've, uh, I posed to Roland when we were originally coming up with these that I think would segue well here is, do you think that the digital format allows for more room to play? Um, not just like to try new things, but also to go outside of the format to do things that maybe you're like, well, you know, due to whatever materials or time constraints or whatever else that you might not have tried in, you know, traditional paper comics. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely you get, uh more room for uh, uh, some of the books. Uh, uh, DC has done the Injustice series, and I, I think it was coming out weekly. And then um, you can get shorter, shorter pieces of it, and you know they can offer it at a different price. It's even I think a different, like a more horizontal format, so it's it's more made to be read on a, a computer screen or a, a tablet. Um, but it, to have that native format, you know, designed for digital and, and to, you know, where you don't have to limit yourself to, okay, I've only got 24 pages, I have to fit my story in, in that. Um, because a lot of, for printed books, you're, they're based off of like a large sheet of paper that's, you know, printed all at once and then folded over and, and cut. So you have to work in like groups of eight pages, you know, 24, 32, however, and, and, and now you can just, well, if I want 25 pages, 26, I could, I could do that in a, a digital book where I can't so much in a, a print without filling, you know, putting in letters pages or throwing a couple pinups in to to pad that. So, uh, yeah, I think it, it digital allows for a lot more uh, experimentation and and storytelling that you there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things we always brag about in comics anyway is that uh, f for for what we do as compared to some of the other entertainment. Uh, delivery methods is you know we've got an unlimited special effects budget, yep. so whatever the the writer can imagine and the and the artist can draw, you can do in a, in a comic book. You don't have to worry about budget as far as special effects go. Um, but I think the digital does allow. Uh, you mentioned Thrillbent, uh, Mark Wade's Thrillbent earlier. I think uh, digital does allow for experimentation. Let's see how you know what and and I think we're experimenting not so much in 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 kind of what we do, but in the, we're, we're adapting to the delivery method. And so we know that we've got these, the, you know, the new uh, digital devices. So we're trying to figure out how to adapt our stories to the, the delivery method of what, you know, what's there. Uh, one of the things I show some of my classes sometimes is, um, 
I, can't, I don't remember the guy's name, but it's, the story is called Worm World Saga. And this goes back a few years now, cer- certainly before all the, the digital stuff. And one of the things I always liked about that is that he created the Worm World, Worm World Saga, and you can find it uh, online for free, uh, legally for free. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he created it like a scroll. And you know, this is one of the things that if you're looking at a computer screen, this is, this is how we look at everything on the computer. And so to read the, the Worm World saga online is, is to look at an, ent- you just scroll down the entire thing. And, and this entire episode, the entire first issue and second issue, they're all delivered in that method. And so that, that's, that's the kind of thing that print doesn't allow you to do. But, but again, I, I think what we're doing is that we're looking at the delivery method and then trying to sort of curb what we do, and I think digital lets us do that and experiment in a fairly reasonably, um, you know, cheap way. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, where if you're going to go print, it, it costs a lot of money to experiment in, in, in print. Where digitally, it's it's the, the 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 cost is mostly your time. Yeah, and that translates also to the amount uh, that that you have to charge. Like uh, there was yeah. Superman Unchained, I think. The, um, the very first issue had this huge gatefold cover. It was like it unfolded six ways from Sunday to see this huge page of Superman saving this falling satellite, and it <laughs> you you paid for it as well. It's beautiful, but it's it, gorgeous. it costs to print that, and that's yeah. that's part of the problem. It's also but, really but awkward the, to read. <laughs> but then the problem is, is that how do you how does that translate to digital? Yeah. Because you can't translate this huge a huge poster like that into a small delivery thing because you're going to get tiny little. You know, you you find that you're ended up you know blowing things up so that you can look at it yeah anytime you get a, a two-page spread you usually have to you know you zoom way out to look at the whole picture and then you got to zoom in t- and move around to see all the details and, and read the word balloons and as a writer i love two-page spreads yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, th- I think there ought to be a moratorium on them um <laughs> no i mean <laughs> seriously i mean i i think the, the problem was for me with something like like warm world and i agree with you it's it's beautiful it's really something to look at uh, is he's got a real problem with how to monetize that. Yes. Now, how do you make right. any money off that now that you've done it? Because you can't go to print. It doesn't, you know, and print is still, at some point it's going to flip and digital is going to be the real money maker in comics. I, I see that coming. But right now, print is still where the money's at in comics. You know, print is making a lot more money than digital still. Uh, and, and the disparity is not really closing that much yet. It will at some point, but it, it's not there yet. So when you do something experimental like that, that, that you know, everybody looks at and goes, wow, this is spectacular. Uh, the only way he can really monetize that is for somebody to see that, fall in love with it, and hire him to do something else more traditional. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and throughput's the same way. It, yeah. know, how do you how do you print that? I mean, it's it's you know that's why if you go to Thrill Thrill Bent, there's only like one episode of each of uh, each of them up there because how do they make money? Yeah, they can't figure out how to make you know, see. I, I'm money. I'm really, and again, I've got a self interest in this, but I, I'm I'm really interested in in finding things that work well, both in on its on a screen and on on the printed page. And, and that's why I was saying there should be a moratorium on double page spreads because they work beautifully in print and terrible on the screen. They do. Yeah. I get a lot of review copies and from various places and usually a two page spread is just cut. It's bisected and so it completely interrupts the narrative mm-hmm. flow and it just, and I'm like, oh, I wish I had this right in front of me because yeah. I'm sure this would be gorgeous. So until we have, you know, fold out screens, you know, that we can do that with. Just put a temporary moratorium on the double spread. Yeah, but single spreads are still great. Our single, you know, splashes splash are still great. You know, but, but, but spreads Jack are, spreads are problematic spreads. in digital. <laughs> oh, I know. Or you're, you know, I if you're, you know, I've got a, I've got a, you know, Samsung, you know, 12 inch. So I, I see the pages at the, you know, actual size, and I'm reading a comic, and oh, there's a double spread. I gotta turn it sideways. <laughs> and it's not nearly as big anymore. And, Since we're already kind of talking about you know, money, making a living at this, um, do digital comics affect the contracts? You know, are, are the contracts pretty much the same now, or do they add? Does the digital phenomenon add some wrinkle to it that's new? One what of the it? biggest changes is that um, the this, the idea of being in print. Old contracts before pre-digital age, uh, your contract, uh, particularly from um, uh, royalty standpoint for if you're doing work for hire, 
uh, which does get earned royalties at Marvel and DC, um, or if, you're, if it's a creator-owned thing, the idea of a work being in print was generally the way that you could uh, determine whether your contract was still uh, valid or not. So a contract would be, you know, here's, here's this contract that I've agreed to work for you. As long as this book is in print, you're going to earn royalties, or as long as this book is in print, we control the rights for it. Um, and that was really easy to determine. If, if you have paper print, it was really easy to determine if a book is in print or not. Well, with digital, the big thing is, is that it's always in print. So how do you, uh, how do you end up canceling your contracts? Uh, so y you have to make, if, if you are a creator that's, that's negotiating a contract, you have to be very sure that you have a clear termination clause in your contract when you're dealing with digital. Because if not, you might end up stuck in a contract forever. You know, and, and t I think for me, that's, that's one of the biggest issues that I see in, in, as far as contracts go. Actually, contractually is probably where digital has had the biggest uh, impact on, on the comic business because of the, the perpetuity aspect. You know, it's, it's always available. Uh, with digital and digital print on demand, it, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily go out of print. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of contracts were perpetuated on, you know, if, if it's not, you know, if it's not currently in print, meaning if we haven't done a print run in X amount of days, it's out of print, right. and you know the contract's void. Um, the the term for at, at the the site I run, Indie Planet, the the terms of service that we have there, when someone you know lists a book to sell there, we say in the in the terms of service that this there is no natural expiration date to this. You can take it down whenever you want just by telling us, you know, there's no penalty. You can take it down whenever, but there's no natural expiration. It's going to stay up there as long as you want it up there. And I'm, I'm probably going to change that because I'm, I'm tired of getting yelled at by people who when they, you know, they get a sale that they, after, you know, five years without getting one, they get a sale and go, why, why are you still selling my book? Because you didn't read your terms <laughs> of service. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, there, there is no natural expiration date with a digital work. Once it's available, you know, it's available. So you have to put an endpoint into a contract if you want there to be one. Mm -hmm. I think in my career, I've, I've made royalties off of, of one series I worked on, uh, Street Fighter. Uh, and that was great. But it, the, all the sales after that, uh, like I, I think in my contracts, I always had it. You know, I had to sell so many copies, um, and then you would earn royalties. And, and there were different levels. But... Uh, I don't know if sales are that much that day, but I, digital was not a, a factor at the time. So now you have, well, you know, are, are they counting physical copies or digital copies mm -hmm. as well? And that's where it's, it's easier just to, you know, publish your own work and you don't have to worry about, <laughs> yeah. about that. But. Well, with, with traditional print, the, the reason that royalties would kick in at a certain point was because the publisher would factor in their their Terms. print and overhead and all these you know their actual costs to figure out at what point the book becomes profitable. Right. And at the point the book becomes profitable for them, then they start spreading the wealth around and you start getting royalties. Well, with with digital, most of that overhead has gone away. So I mean, in, in theory, then the book could be profitable at a drastically you know lower level than it could be. I'm sorry, in digital it could be profitable at a drastically lower level than it could be in print, so. Yeah, I, I want to make one little uh, note before you move on to the next thing about uh, the contracts is that um, I if there are those out there who, are, who have created uh, a, a comic property, one of the things you have to be careful in your contract is that uh, I, in print, a lot of times the publishers, if you're submitting, if you're not going to self-publish it, which is a great, great way to go, if you are submitting it to publishers, one of the things that a lot of uh, small press publishers want to do is they want to uh, control the rights as long as they are publishing the work. And this is not unusual. Uh, I mean, it's certainly very negotiable, but it's not unusual because they, the publishers kind of see it as like, oh, look, we're, we're spending our money. We're, you know, we're giving you some money to, to do this book. It's your book. You still own it. You you created it. You are the owner. But while we're publishing it, we're going to sort of control the rights. And now you can determine all those. You can have you can let them do zero if you want to. But many of them will try to get a lot of those rights because what they really want to do is take it and sell it to Hollywood. Okay. This way, if they're the if they're the publisher of your work, um, then if they control the rights, if they can 
sort of they sort of acting like the agent. If they can sort of agent your work into Hollywood, then they get a, a chunk of that pie. And so the big deal for creators is if you sign a contract with a publisher and you don't have a termination clause, then your work, even though you might have moved on, your work is still going to be with this publisher until you can figure out how to get it uh, canceled. Mm -hmm. And if you have moved on and doing you know, other and bigger things and are finding success outside of the, the comics that are bringing you money, then you, you're stuck in this contract. So you have to be really careful yeah. with that because that's one of the biggest reasons publishers want to control the rights is so that they can, they can kind of sell them and make money otherwise. Absolutely. Well, since we are talking about digital and we are talking about trying to make a living doing this, the, the big bugaboo here is piracy. You know, how, and so I think that's something that should be addressed. You know, what role has digital piracy played in the industry? How has it affected it? You know, what are the measures that are being taken to combat it? Has it affected sales, jobs, anything like that? Before DC went um, same day digital, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine at DC, and they, and there's no way to really know exactly how many. Uh, pirated copies or how many sales they lose. Th there's no way to really accurately measure that, especially with digital because it's not like, oh, there are four bottles of water up here and suddenly they're gone. Well, you can measure that. There are four water bottles that are missing. Digital, you can't really me measure it. But uh, a friend of mine at, at DC, they, they speculated that they were losing. This is pre, this is before they went same day digital. They speculated that they were losing about 20,000 sales per title, right? right. <laughs> so if DC, I can't do that kind of math, uh, if DC you know, publishes 50 titles a month, you're talking about 50 titles times 20,000 copies, that's a sizable number. They were, they were speculating that they were losing that many sales on their print copies because they were releasing the paper and then not releasing the digital to later. And what was happening is, is in, I'm sure it wasn't in the United States, but uh, somewhere overseas, uh, they were taking these print books and they were scanning them and they were you know, putting them up and, and causing lots of uh, um, pirated issues to be available. Uh, their speculation was that um, once they went same day, they chewed into those 20,000 and regained some of those sales digitally because, you know, I mean, we like to tell ourselves that people are going to pay for them if they have the option to fa pay for them. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I think that's the kind of the general consensus is that, yeah. you know, if it's available, somebody will pay for it. So I, I think that... Um, I think piracy is an issue, and I don't know that anyone has actually figured out exactly how to address that. And uh, Barry probably has some. Space. I'm going to take a contrarian point of view on there. Okay. I think the BitTorrent <laughs> sites drug the major publishers kicking and screaming into the digital age. Uh, I, I think the the reason that that Marvel and DC and and Image was actually going into it pretty quickly, as was Dark Horse, but Marvel and DC especially uh, might still not be offering downloads of their books if the, if the torrent sites hadn't forced them into it just by demonstrating what a demand there was and that, you know, if you're not going to do this, we're going to do this. Uh, I, I think they actually did the major publishers a service. And I, I think in some respects they still do them a service in, uh, in promoting work that, uh, and helping build audiences. I mean, there have been some savvy creators who have... Uh, who have figured out ways to, you know, to use the torrent sites to their advantage, uh, you know, by by seeing, you know, when their books are on the sites and when they're when they're being downloaded in big numbers, and by making a big deal of the fact that I mean, Game of Thrones did this on TV. They got huge mileage out of the fact that you know we're the most pirated show in history. You know, <laughs> they turned it into a they turned it into a positive. And I know there've been some savvy comic creators who have done the same things. You know by saying, look, there's a clear demand for my book. People are, you know, people are reading it, you know. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of negatives. Well, and that, that but there's also, you know... It, that forced HBO, now they have the, the right. HBO uh, go, go, I think it is, the... You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes a black market can, can force the legitimate market's hand, and I, and I think that's really what happened. With, uh, with digital comics. I, I, I think we're in a much better place now than we would have been uh, if that black market hadn't cropped up. Now, you know, we need to be doing what we can to, to kind of quash that black market now, but, uh, but I think 
all in all, it's been a net positive. Part of it, one problem I've had is, is like the price. Uh, you know, paying four dollars for a new comic when if I'm getting a paper comic, I feel like I've gotten something. Where for the digital book, I don't feel like I'm getting as much for my money as you know. There's there's not so much the distributor and the retailer. I'm buying it directly from the the company, so it's there's still that feeling of the, the slight feeling of I'm I'm being ripped off. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm, I'm not getting as much. Again, value. I'm going to take the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> this, this this is the case where where I see the publisher's point of view. The publisher's point of the, the 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 big publisher point of view is well, what are you paying for? Are you paying for the story? You're paying for paper. You know, if you're paying for the story, then the delivery mechanism really shouldn't matter that much. You know, I I don't I don't pay four dollars for digital books. I wait till they go on sale at Comicsology. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> but I but I see the publisher's point of view there is you know are you are you paying for our stories or are you paying for the paper you know what, what do you well let's flip it around a little bit and talk about the collecting side of this I mean I think we all started and well not not we <laughs> I'm not in it uh, I wish I were but that's a whole other thing <laughs> but I think most everybody who gets into the business does so because of the genuine love of the medium you know you don't go in the comics to make a lot of money sadly enough no. and so i think we all at one point or another start out as collectors and so how does the movement towards digital affect that because i know for me i still have a very like i barely read ebooks because i love the physicality and for me it feels more real for lack of a better term and so does that change things around or does digital free us up to collect even more well, I, th I think there's a couple of issues. Is that um, the, the first one, of course, is that you can't get your digital copy signed, you know, by Stan Lee. Yep. Uh, so, so you you have that, you know, if you've got a paper copy, it's easy to get an autograph um, on the book itself. Is what I guess what I mean. He'll sign your device. You just got to pay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it comes hard uh, to read. <laughs> but it, you know, for, as from a collector too, though, is like you know, I mean, I have my collection. And my print copies are worth something. Mm -hmm. My digital copies are worth only what I paid for them. Yeah. You know, so I, I think there's a, uh, you know, there's a difference there because I really can't, you know, I mean, I really can't give you my digital copy. Yeah. I could give you my print copy, but I, c I couldn't give you my digital copy. So I, I think it, 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 on one hand, it's, uh, it's more easily accessible, but on the other hand, then there's the value that, that they don't maintain the value. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't think it, it's. It, I really don't think digital has had an effect on collecting because I think the the comics market, the structure of the comics market, took care of the collecting problem a long time ago. You know, really nothing since the since the advent of the direct market system of comic shops. You know, there have only been a handful of books that have really appreciated in value in a notable way. You know, any genuine comic collecting. Uh, is pretty much before 1980. You know, it are really are the only collectible comics out there. Are things printed before the 1980s. So uh, if if you want something printed since then, there's plenty of copies around for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah. It's, it's not so much a, a, a hunt for comics as it is for a you your know, copy of Spawn Number One. Gathering. is really not yeah. worth 50 bucks. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's there's 10 <laughs> copies for everybody who wants one. Yeah. My special foil cover of X-Men number one from the 90s isn't it yeah. worth as much yeah. as they told me it was. No. Polybagged and everything. Because everybody has copies. Yeah. Well, that, that is one aspect I, I miss is the, you know, being a kid and, and running into every convenience store and, and going through the, the racks and, and looking for those new books. And, and if you miss some, that when the local conventions came to town, that was your chance to go fill in the holes in your in your collection. and. Now with you know eBay and and the, and especially now digital, you just go and and buy them. So it's like, but it also uh, digital has allowed like every week I I try to take the titles I read and and post a little review on on Facebook every week and that leads into discussion. So and a lot of it is with people that I don't even know that well. Somebody will see it and. And then, uh, and every time I post, uh, you know, I give something a, uh, you know, nine out of ten. Uh, usually, like on Twitter, the the artist or the writer will see it and and favor it, and then it's like, oh, that's cool. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just don't post about the new Batgirl cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, the the social aspect of it is, you know, I I don't get to hang out in the comic store 
talking to a couple of people anymore, but I have people online that I have ongoing discussions with comics now that I never would have before. So, so how does this affect comic stores? Do you think the traditional brick and mortar comic stores? I mean, are are they going to be affected? Are they going to go away? Or, um, and is this a good or a bad thing? I mean, I I love going to my local comic shop and you know, having my 20 minutes of geekery or whatever, and like, oh, did you read what happened to Spider-Verse? Oh, my God, I can't believe it. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And th I find that very enjoyable along, it's part of almost the ritual of it. But it's also nice to get a, like, a 99-cent copy of something online. Yeah. So. Well, I think one of the things J Jeff was talking about is that, you know, one of the things that you got at your at your comic shop was that, you know, I mean... Comic book readers are geeks, and I don't say that in a disparaging way at all. But the problem is, is that now, and of course, Full Sail is a geek university. So, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it is, and that, again, I don't say that disparagingly. I say that in a cool way. But part of what happened is the local comic shop is where you could find like-minded people. Yeah. You know, uh, where I went to college, I was not, I was not at, at geek school. I was not surrounded by cool people who liked comic books and things like that. Um, there were the occasional ones there, but I had to find them by going to the comic shop. Mm -hmm. So I would go to the comic shop and I would find the other people locally who also enjoyed comics. And that's kind of where we, you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, that was the watering hole. That was, mm -hmm. the, that was the bar. That was the cheers. That was, that was where yeah. we went to, to kind of hang out with like-minded people. And we would gather on Wednesdays on New Comic Book Day and we would, you know, we'd talk about the new comics. And, and that's, that's kind of where we saw our people. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that that happens so much anymore. That's where your parents would know where you were. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> actually, I, I, I think that's that's what the uh, comic shops are doing actually surprisingly well right now. They're actually kind of in, in spite of people like me who thought they were doomed as soon as you know digital became uh, you know kind of hit the masses. They're actually thriving right now, and I, I think one of the reasons that they're thriving is exactly what you're saying there. They've become social gathering places, uh, you know. I'm sure a lot of the people who are shopping at, cop at, at comic shops right now are buying some of their books digitally, but they're still going to the shop for that social interaction. They're still going to that shop to, you know, to see things that they might not otherwise have seen. And you know, the really good comic shops, the ones that foster that, are thriving right now. You know, some of the, the bad comic shops that were you know, dungeons and, and <laughs> terrible places to go, and the only reason you went was because that was the only place to get your comics, you know, those, you know, a lot of those shops, you know, taken out in the back of the alley and, you know, <laughs> done away with. And that's been a good thing. But, uh, but, but digital has absolutely not had the, you know, the, the, the catastrophic effect on, on comic shops that a lot of us predicted it would. Well, I think it, it forces the comic shops to have better uh, customer service. Like, I, yeah. I listened to one of the podcasts last week about comics, and uh, there was a, one of the hosts was saying he... The local shop he went to, uh, he said they, they didn't have a couple of the books that he had requested to be pulled, and they just didn't pay him any attention and, and were not apologetic about it, and he was mad, and he said, I'm, I'm not going in there anymore. I might as well just buy them digital if that's the experience I'm going to get. So I think that forces the good shops to to pay more attention to their customers and give better service and you know offer a, a more diverse line of products. They have the the trading cards, and a lot of them do the you know online gaming, and the you know they. They have more than just comics in their shops, so they, and it all is uh, a lot of it revolves around you know interaction with each other. The kids are playing the, the card games and the computer games, and and then also you know talking about the the comics. So it, it does lead to a little geek mm -hmm. place where you you feel at home. And despite the the, the stereotype that geeks are antisocial people, uh, I mean just look at the the, the success and popularity of, of comic shows. I mean, they're not. I mean, they're not. It's not just San Diego Comic Con. I mean, they're everywhere now, uh, and, and those things, you know, are massively attended by geeks. You know, it's it's we go and we we show up in droves, and and so you know we're not we're not really as antisocial as a lot of the <laughs> the the popular media would would have you believe. So, uh, in some ways, it seems like comics are. Facing the same issues that print, r traditional print books are as well, and there's always this debate. You know, there are people who oh doom and gloom. Oh my gosh, 
you know, the book is going away. It's all going to be electronic anymore. And so do you feel, I think this is a good way to kind of end this before we get into the, the Q&A session. Do you feel like the uh, uh, traditional print comics are going away or is it just going to be different somehow? You know, like there, it's going to be more like special things are going to be done in print where other things are going to be more digital. I think there will always be some some form of print, just like with you know newspapers and books. There, I can't see it ever going completely away. And, and the same thing with comics is, like I said, that was so much a part of of the industry for me as a kid was not just you know the reading, but the you know collecting them and having them. And I don't feel the same way about my my digital collection as you know where I can look at it and go, ooh, I, you know I've got all these issues and I. So I I think there is something special about having the the printed copies, you know. But there, you know, digital offers a a neat alternative. But I think there's room for the two to coexist. I think Barry touched on it earlier. I, I think, um, and I've said this before. I, I don't think that that print will go away until digital really figures out how to monetize. Mm -hmm. I think once digital figures out how to uh, get that money that that print gets. Um, until that happens, we are still going to see print. I mean, the other thing is, that, you know, if there are comic book readers in here, uh, you know, I would be willing to bet that most of them, like like me, like to still hold the, yeah. the, uh, the occasional comic book in their hands. There's just something, I mean, you know, yeah. maybe I'm the only one, but no, there's I just something about taking that comic book going, <laughs> you know, I just, I don't know if it's the it. ink or yeah. what. I don't know, but yeah. you can't do that digitally. No, so. no, you can't. And you, and, yeah. you, and you don't want to do that with some of the books printed in Asia today. No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Inks or whatever they, they, they smell terrible. <laughs> I, I got, a, I got a, a book in the mail that I, that I pledged on Kickstarter the other day, and I opened it up, and it's just, it's noxious. <laughs> you know, the smell coming off of those inks, I, I don't know what they mix in them. Um, print's not going away anytime soon. Pr print's actually getting stronger. It, it surprises me. I was one of the, the, the doomsayers a few years ago. Um, print's getting stronger. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and for all the, the gloom and doom talk about the book industry, uh, books are selling well today. Now, bookstores are crashing right and left because you know, they, they had a bad business model. Yeah. But, but books, books are doing well. And comics are bouncing back really strongly. Uh, you know, for the first time in uh, it was well more than a decade, uh, there was a, a comic that had a, a million plus print run uh, here recently. Uh, it was one of the, the Star Wars titles, I think, right at Marvel. You know, million plus print run. We haven't seen that in comics in a very long time. And you know, even it's kind of skewed by was it Loot Crate or Nerd Box, one of the ones that that, that picked it up. It kind of skewed the numbers a little bit. But that's still a million copy print run. You, you can't sneer at that too much. So, and 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 you know the best selling comics every month are con are consistently hitting over the hundred thousand point. You know that's that's a strong market. Do you think in print uh, alone? Right? And I, I'm going to toss out a question. Do that's you think that it's because um, you know because Marvel and DC aren't doing what the kind of numbers they 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 used to do certainly in the in the 90s and not even Marvel and DC today are not even doing what they were in the in the 80s, um, and that that they tend to be the measuring stick that we use to measure the industry. So do you think then uh, what's happened is that instead of these two companies getting a larger chunk of the pie, and when we're talking about particularly print, that it's kind of spread out because. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of stuff available on Indie Planet. When you know, there's a lot of stuff on Comicsology that's not Marvel and DC. The, uh, the the shape of the comics industry used to be an inverted pyramid. You know, it was it was very top heavy. It was all the Marvel and DC stuff sold in crazy numbers, and then you trickle down to by, by the time you got to the number 300 best selling comic, you were at something that was selling about 2,000 copies a month. You know, it was really top heavy. What we've seen in the past decade or so is the middle is expanding. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's growth in the middle. The top is you know still, you know, it's it's higher than it was, but it's fractionally higher than it was. The middle is expanding, and because the middle is expanding, it's pushing the base out too. Uh, this is something we've never seen before in comics: is seeing growth from the middle, and uh, and I think you can attribute a lot of that to digital. Uh, I think a lot of it's technological in that, you know, people are able to see and share things, you know, in ways that they never were before. 
But, uh, but this, is, this, is a, this is an unusual position for those of us who have been in comics for a number of years. Yeah. This is the first time we've really seen growth in our lifetimes, and it's kind of strange. And as a creator, that's kind of exciting. Yes. I mean, I, 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 will, I will say this, and I used to say it in my class multiple times, is that I, I don't get excited about, uh, I don't get that excited about what the, the major companies do. I get excited about independent comics. I, there's a lot of stuff in the independent market that I get excited about when I see. It's like, oh, this, is, this looks, you know, new and original and exciting, but I don't get that way for the, the top two companies. No, well, let, me, let me clarify what I said. The, the, we, we saw growth, you know, back in the 90s, but it was, yeah. it was fake growth. Yeah. It, w it was artificial fake growth, and it was a Ponzi scheme that collapsed. This is the first time in, in my lifetime or in my career in comics that we've actually seen legitimate growth. Okay, uh, that's a great place to stop. So um, at this time, we have a few minutes for questions from our audience. You know, if you have a question for our plan panelists, please raise your hand, and the microphone will be brought to you. And for those of you, those of you who are joining us online, please direct your uh, questions to uh, our online moderator. We'll try to accommodate any questions that you have. Um, hi. I was wondering how you guys get over your art block or your writer's block. Like, is there a process oh. for that? Hi. Okay. We got a lot of light shining in our eyes. <laughs> okay, I can stand. Would that be better? Wouldn't hurt. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you are. Hi. So, do you want me to? So, I'll, I'll no. I think I, I'll address it first uh, because the mine, mine might be the mean answer. Uh, I don't believe in writer's block. Uh, I, I think it's writer's excuse. Um, I think that, uh, having said that, I don't think that, uh, what I'm saying is I don't think that that you can be working on a story and all the answers come to you. I certainly think that you can, um, you can experience frustrations in a story, but a writer writes, uh, a carpenter doesn't get carpenter's block. Uh, they, they still have to go hammer and, and, and work on a house. And they may, they may not know how to put this, I don't know, I don't do carpentry, but they may not know how to put this corner together, but the house still has to be built. Uh, and so a writer has got to write. If you're a writer, you're going to write. Well, you put this thing aside. If this thing is giving you fits, you put it aside, and you go write on something else. Um, in, in my experience, the answer to whatever's giving you fits will always come when you're working on something else. You, you start, you, your mind starts going somewhere else, uh, and you work on this, and you go, that's how I can address this problem, and then you go back in there. So I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in writer's frustration, but anyone who tells me they have writer's block, I'm telling the, I tell them that they're making excuses for not writing. <laughs> i tell you a little, a little practical trick that I, that I do a lot of times when I'm, uh, if I find myself sitting at the computer and I'm not sure what, you know, uh, staring at the white screen and kind of got the fingers hovering over the keyboard. A lot of times what I'll do is uh, I, keep, I keep notebooks and pens. And I'll go sit down in a comfortable chair with my notebook and pen, and I'll start physically writing. I find that uh, my, sometimes when I'm sitting in front of the keyboard, uh, my brain goes directly to my fingers, and if my brain's not sure what to do next, my fingers have got nothing to do next. <laughs> but when I'm writing, it takes me longer to put my thought down. And that somehow helps me focus, you know, and go to my next thought while I'm writing down the last one. You know, and after I get a page or two scribbled down on a note, piece of notebook paper or a, a pad or something, then I can go back to the computer and go, okay, and I'll start trapping that in. And it gets, I'm, it's just a little diversionary thing, but it, it really works for me. It's similar to what I, I do when I, it was something's not working, I'll, I'll go back and uh, I, I journal a lot, like every day, that's how I, I start my day and I'll, I find out if, if I come to a point where I'm stuck on something, it's because I usually haven't planned out what I haven't, like you said, you sit down at a white page and you want to start drawing, but you're not sure what to do. It's like, well, I haven't, I haven't really planned it out, so I'll, I'll do some writing for a bit or just some sketching and, and then come back to it. And, Another good strategy, though, is if you, find, if you do find yourself uh, experiencing this frustration frequently, is that... Uh, my, my prognosis would be that you're probably not reading very much uh, or at least enough at that moment because I, I find that uh, most writers I know are inspired by the works that they read as well. And so um, make, make sure that you're working reading into your daily uh, writer's habit. What, read whenever you want to, but work that in so that, so that you're reading good content. Uh, and I think that you'll find that your mind is going to be working over the stuff that you're reading and that will help to 
overcome any kind of obstacles that you have. And if I could add to that just a little bit, read far afield. You know, if your primary interest is science fiction or fantasy or whatever, or comics, you know, certainly read all of that, but go beyond that. Read nonfiction, read history, read uh, mysteries, read anything you can, you know, box a bis bisquick, you know, just read it <laughs> because it's going to expand you and introduce you to just so many different ideas and a huge world that you can then incorporate into your own work and add something unique and different and very much your own to it. And if, and if you really just can't get going, then, you know, that, that could be your subconscious telling you that that's the wrong story. You know, you really just don't want to write this. So find something else. You know? Yeah. Well, with uh, similar to the writing, when uh, doing artwork, like I, I have a, a lot of folks I follow on uh, Pinterest, and I'll go on there and and just browse and uh, save things to my own galleries, which are are mainly just for my reference, so that when I want to go back and you know when I'm thinking of something, I have a couple of you know galleries that I can go look through and just say, oh man, that's you know, and you get inspired. That's yeah, works for me a lot. So. Hi, I, I, oh. I have a question from the live stream from Tara. She asks, the digital age opens up new platforms of storytelling like transmedia and web comics. How do these new platforms affect the art of comic book writing? I don't write them. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> One of the things you know we talked about uh, br briefly was the, we're, we're tailoring uh, what we're doing to the delivery method, and so you know when when we teach or when I teach the the comic writing, one of the things we're always looking at is, that, is you know we traditionally we devour a comic in the page, right? So we 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 study the page, what's on the page, what makes the page, how do you read the page, that kind of thing. Uh, digital, if, you, if they're delivered a panel at a time, then you're going to have to start thinking in panels more than in pages. Of course, the, the, there's so many questions when you come to web comics is because not all web comics are, are similar. Some web comics are actually delivered in a you know, you click on it and it's a page. It's a it's a full comic page. Some of them are delivered in panels, like a strip. Like a strip. Uh, some of them have multiple panels. So. Um, and none of those writing, writing for those things are not really new. I mean, there have been strips have been around for a long time, panels have been around the comic pages. So as a writer, you've just kind of got to know what your in delivery method is and then write to that method uh, or write to that, that delivery style, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, and more a, a strip format, you can't, you can't as easily write a, a story with, a, you know, the beginning, middle, end, the the suspense that you're you're having to just put out you know a couple panels every every day so it's it, you know or every couple of days to to fill that in but there, if there's not really an end point you're just adding on perpetually so it's it's a I think it's a very different animal than what a comic book mm. is so a web comic could be very very different more open ended uh, storytelling I guess. Hi, uh, whoa, hi, uh, really appreciate you guys coming here. Um, I was wondering, I, I, my question's kind of two-part. Uh, one, what in this new age, what do you feel uh, when it comes to storytelling elements, uh, parts of a story that are really gonna grab people these days, these current readers, what do you feel that they are um, into the most, whether consciously or even subconsciously, what do you think grabs readers the most? Uh, these days, and and the second part is, do you feel that the the di that the digital or the print affects that in any way? <laughs> you know, I, I, that's almost one of those questions. If if we had the exact answer for that, we'd we'd uh, be millionaires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it what was it? Faulkner said the the only thing worth writing about was the human heart in conflict with itself. Yeah. You know, it, it's in and that's that's even that's true in comics. I mean, it, 
the, the comic world is really devoted to its characters. Character. Right? And the reason why we're so devoted to the characters, I would argue, is because back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had writers who wrote characters. Uh, you like Wolverine not because of the claws, but because he, you know, he carried this, uh, you know, thing for Jean Grey in his heart that he knew he could never, you know, he was a tortured soul. That was the first thing that, you know, you might not have realized that was why you liked and identified with Wolverine, but you identified with him because he was an outsider who wanted to fit in, and he didn't, and he had this thing for the girl that he couldn't have, and the fact that he had cool claws and sideburns were just an added bonus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, Spider-Man, everybody fell in love with Spider-Man because the kid's life was hell. I mean, Stan put him through the ringer back in the 60s. And, you know, you identified with that. It was relatable. It was, yeah, it really was. And so, uh, you know, Batman is this, you know, you know, tragic orphan who should have been in counseling a long time ago. <laughs> and, you know, you know, Superman, the same thing, you know. He's, he's, he's got a, you know, he had a great family, but, you know, he was an outsider. He was an orphan. It's, it's, it's characters. And, and uh, that's what, you know, that's what's always driven stories is, and that's, that's really what drives comics today is people's love of the, you know, of characters. And I think comics a lot of times, uh, they're very much the, the outcast character uh, because, and, and, and I don't know that this is a good or a bad thing, it just <laughs> is thing, I think, but, you know, it is still primarily dominated, by, even though it's growing, it is still primarily dominated by sort of a geek culture. And geek culture, you know, we do kind of live on the fringe of society. Um, and so we kind of are drawn to those kinds of characters who are also sort of outcast or, or on the fringe or wh however you want to say it. So um, I don't necessarily think that, that, that print or digital affects that at all. I think it's just um, a different delivery method. Um, just, you know... So, no, that's the end of my answer. <laughs> I would add that maybe the age of the readers would have something to do with it as well, because primarily, and of course, you have now an aging populace of comic book readers, but they started when they were kids, you know, especially a lot of them around the time when they started entering puberty. And God knows puberty plays a huge part in a lot of <laughs> comic book stories. I mean, when you're, if you're a mutant in Marvel, Puberty is usually when the X gene takes and kicks in, and so you feel, even if you are like, you know, the jock or the cheerleader, all these other stereotypes that usually they're fitting in, you know, inside you are this bubbling crockpot of raging hormones, and you feel gawky and weird, and you feel like an outcast, and so you see these people who are going through similar problems, then you identify with that. And so I, I would say that's probably a part of it, too. Well, probably now a lot of younger uh, people's introduction to comics comes from, like, uh, the movies now, yeah. which there are a lot of real good quality movies and, and well-done stories that were actually stories that came from the comics, and that, you know, that leads people back to the original source material, and that's, that's great for mm -hmm. our industry, so... Um, that's that's one thing that I, I see digital having a, an impact on is making that easier to get to you know some kid who's seen a movie he likes and wants to you know well I, I want to find you know want to read more of this character and you know it's readily available to him. So. Hi, how y'all doing? Hi. Um, so Barry, is it? Yes. Um, okay, so my question is specifically for you, but all three of you can answer. Um, bloating and decompression, which we were talking about earlier, um, do you think it's the reason for people nowadays having the shorter attention span that, you know, the story writers would have to kind of hold their hand along with the story? I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it could be. I, I don't know. I, I, think it's, I think it's more, uh, I think it's more about, uh, there's a lot of comic writers that want to be writing movies. Yeah. And, uh, and so the scripts that they're turning in are film scripts. Mm -hmm. And it, in you know, film scripts, you can have those moment-to-moment -moment transitions. You need to have those moment-to-moment -moment transitions. That's not how you need to write a comic script, though. It, you know, a comic script needs to focus you know, on what happens in this panel, 
and then you've got to go to the next panel, but you've got to create, you know, a, a, a closure in the gutters between those two panels, and and uh, and that's hard. You know, it takes some real skill to write a comic script that way. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of skill. I would argue that it's a lot harder to do that than it is just to write a. a, a I mean, I've written plays. I've written you know f scripts. It's 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 challenging, but it's. You know, when you don't have to worry about, you know, those transitions quite so much, it's a lot easier. You know, comics are a little bit harder, I think. I think uh, my students, I, I got a, a couple of them in here, can probably attest that uh, one of the biggest things that I always say in, in my class is that a comic is not a movie. And that's the biggest challenge for, for many of my students coming into the class is that, you know, I always challenge them to try to think of it in a different way. It's that, you know, and Frank Miller's got a good quote that I always uh, show. I can't remember the exact quote now, but basically it's something to the effect of, like, when you're trying to uh, turn your comic into a storyboard for a film, then you're going to fail because they're two different, they're basically, they're two different delivery methods. And I think that's, that is kind of the biggest challenge is that so many of, of uh, writers today are thinking of um, a comic as a storyboard for a film, and that's that's you know to me that kind of destroys what the comic book is supposed to be. Yeah, well, I've seen some great examples of, of storytelling done that way, but then there are some where I, as an artist, I look at if if a panel has been just duplicated like three times with just like one little minor change, I look at that and go, ah, that's cheating. That's you shouldn't be uh, <laughs> you shouldn't be paid for that that full page if yeah. you're. Just well, copying a, a panel over. And there's some things, and we talk, and of course this fits in with the decompression thing, there's some things that you just, that you, you just ought not be attempted, like characters should wink in a comic, <laughs> right? Because it takes you three panels right. to, to show the wink, right? There's the open eye, the closed eye, the open eye. <laughs> uh, you know, and head nods, you know, you can't show a head nod in, in, in a comic. <laughs> but uh, you can imply all those things. Sure, you can imply yeah. all this. Yeah. Is we, this is the reason the characters say yes, right? They don't have to nod their head, they say <laughs> yes, right? So, or or you, in the next panel, you could have a character say, "Did you wink at me?" <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, and it accomplishes yeah. the same thing. Yeah. You know, you you can make your reader believe they saw something they didn't see. Yep. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of comics I read as a kid where I, I am absolutely convinced I saw something, yeah. and then I go back and read them, and that it didn't actually happen on the page. It happened in the story, mm -hmm. but it didn't actually happen on the page. Yeah. But you filled it in. And yeah, I, I saw it. Yeah. Uh, hey, how's it going? Hey. <laughs> uh, I, I've always been wondering because I've always wanted to ask like artists and writers, writers just whenever I meet them, how exactly did you guys get started in the comic book industry? Like, what was, you know, who did you meet? Did you write a job applications, uh, 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 go to art school, anything like that? <laughs> I know for myself, um, I went to local conventions. Um, I'm from the Daytona Beach area, and I knew uh, uh, John Beatty as an anchor for a lot of comics. I met him, and uh, he needed help doing backgrounds. And I, I would show him my work all the time, and he would, you know, well, you're not quite there yet, but he, you know, he, when I got to a certain point, he would say, okay, I'm gonna let you start thinking some backgrounds and, and uh, filling in for him. And, and he would show me a lot of techniques and all that. And then I would uh, uh, send off samples to all the, all the different companies. Every couple of weeks, I had a packet of like six pages. And I would ma uh, mail them out to all the other companies. And, and uh, I picked up some work at uh, New England Comics, working on the tech, and did a couple issues of that. And then I got a call from uh, Malibu and uh, had a, a pretty good run there. And that's how it all it all just built, and and it, it's all networking basically. And uh, you know, as you go to the the local shows, uh, try to meet guys who are in the in the area. There's quite a few in, in Florida here, um, and you just be persistent, keep showing them the stuff. And uh, now I think it's uh, social media is a large part of it, putting your work out and having the the DeviantArt Gallery, the you know, sharing your work and. Because um, a lot of the companies are not so much accepting solicitations, so it's it's uh, just getting your your work in front of people and, and kind of building a following. And if you put it out there and people see it and, and spread it around, uh, 
you know, and, that, and it's good they'll they'll find their way to you. So, man, it's so much um, easier to break into comics today than it was. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's so much easier. I mean, you know, now it, to make money at it, it's just as hard as it ever was. But if you want to say, I am a comic book creator, I am a comic book artist, then all you got to do is make a comic. And there's ways to get it out there that weren't available to us when we started. You know, and you can, you can walk up to somebody and hand them your comic and say, this is my comic, I am a comic book artist. It's so much easier to do. It's not any easier to actually make the comic. That's still a lot of hard work. It's not any easier to make money at it. That's still a lot of hard work. But to actually break in and be a comic artist and be part of the club is so much easier today than it's ever been at any time. Yeah, my, my story, I, I'm from Mississippi, so um, it's not just a comic publishing mecca. Um, so I knew I wanted to do, do comics since I was uh, real young. Barry can attest since, to this. Since, since I introduced them to him. That's right, since I was in sixth grade. Um, I just didn't, it was one of those things, I didn't know how to do them. Uh, I went to college, got a degree in creative writing. <clears throat> was not allowed to write any kind of science fiction or fantasy or anything cool in my creative writing program because those things weren't allowed. Um, but I knew I wanted to do comics. And so uh, from the, I guess from about the time in high school through all my, through I, I don't draw, so uh, I kept, you know, trying to meet artists and trying to do something and, you know, this one would fall through and then I'd meet another artist and this one would fall through. And it wasn't until I got into college and I met a couple of uh, pretty talented artists that um, also were very serious about breaking into the industry. We put together, uh, actually we put together several uh, comics to try to pitch to a publisher. We actually were going to kind of do it on our own, but uh, realized it was a lot of work and required a lot of money at the time, which we didn't have. So we just sent, we, we made photocopies of, and I literally sent out a package about that thick uh, and sent them off to half a dozen comic book publishers and finally found one that said, we like what we see, we want to publish your work. Um, took several months to happen because this was in the day, you know, where I literally had to go to Kinko's and make photocopies and mm -hmm. uh, put it in a big envelope and pay the, you know, four bucks postage to get it there. We're on time. Uh, yeah, we're almost out of time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But one thing led to another and that's kind of how I did it. All right, so I want to thank you so much for attending our session today, everyone. And we want to especially thank our guests, Barry, Jeff, and Roland. So thank you so much for your uh, knowledge and your valuable information. I hope everybody has a great day.